Hello, this is Craig Mertens, Director of Product Education for Inktavo, the parent company of Graphics Flow, Inksop, Printavo, and now Sign Tracker, the newest addition to our family of brands. If you're not familiar with Sign Tracker, Sign Tracker is a shop management tool for sign shops. And so that's now part of our Inksop family of, I guess you would call it our tech stack. I call it an ecosystem as well. So we have a complete comprehensive solution across all aspects of apparel decoration and sign making now. So that's great for me because I, my roots are in, in the sign industry. I've been involved in the sign industry in terms of building out products for that industry for uh, coming up on 30 years. So it's fun getting involved in that company and also working with Joe Aranella, who is the founder of that company and getting to learn a new software. Yes, learn a new software. So I get to learn new software programs as well. And yes, I do read the manual if it's available. So the class we're going to teach today is going to be on planning. And I know end of year, you know, people are busy, orders are flowing in, you're getting all your end of the year stuff ramped up, but guess what's right around the corner, January 1. Like many of us in the decorated apparel industry, we go into kind of a, a bit of a time frame where it's like, I call it the doldrums. If you don't know what the doldrums are, that's when you're sailing and the wind stops and filling your sails and you're just kind of stuck there. And one of the things that I really advocate to any small business is using that kind of so-called downtime to do two things. Number one, planning to make sure that you're set up, you know, for the next year and that you've done your due diligence, that you have a plan put in place, um, you have measurables to measure the results of that plan. And the, the other thing is prospecting. It's a great time to do prospecting. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, prospecting in the course of this class today, but the main thing that I want to talk about is planning and how to put together a plan. So I'm going to share my screen here, a business plan. So a lot of times people envision a business plan as being this big, gigantic, enormous, complex document. If you ever had to do a business plan in college, it was probably like that. If you've ever paid a consulting firm to come in and do a business plan for you, wow, what a process. They, I've done that twice in my career and they take it very, very deep into the intricate details of the company. That's not what we're talking about here. I think if I had to give out a homework assignment to my customers and saying, Hey, I need you to do a, to a Wharton school of business level business plan. I think folks would be a pretty turned off by that and B, I think there'd be a fair amount of kidding around to it. The concept that I've worked with, and it's not a new concept, but it's a concept that I've worked with is a one page business plan a simple outline that goes through what is your purpose for your business? What is your vision? You know, some of the basic fundamentals like, you know, who are my target markets? You know, what's my comp competition up to? You know, really, what is my competitive advantage? You know, what are, what are my plans for marketing? But most importantly, strengths and weaknesses. You know, where am I really strong taking an honest look at yourself? Because it doesn't work unless you take an honest look at yourself in saying, where am I strong? Where can I improve? Because one of the things that's happened in the business climate that we're currently in is the price of entry into our industry is very low these days. You know, you can enter the industry with a heat transfer press. You don't even need heat press. You can just be a sales organization, but you can enter our industry certainly with a heat transfer press, order transfers from a company like Stalls or Supercolor, and you're in business. So there is a bit of this flood of new people entering the market. So when that occurs, one of the things that we have to do as small business owners is we have to buckle up and really be smart about the way we run our business. And I think the smartest thing you can do entering into the year 2024 is put together a one page business plan. So I'm going to show you an example of a one page business plan that I did for a company called Craig's Creations, but I put together a little business plan for Craig's Creations. And maybe when I retire, this is what I'll go back to doing because I have a passion and love for apparel decoration. What is our company mission? Company mission is to ins inspire creativity by creating decorated apparel and personalized products that serve the needs of our community. This particular business is community-based, so I'm not working on a national level. I'm working with organizations and groups within our community. So I think defining your mission is really important. What, why am I really doing this? What was my in, original intent of my business? And where did that lead me to? Because the mission oftentimes from your original intent of your business is quite different once you roll up your sleeves and actually get active in your business. And I can't tell you how many times I've talked to customers. They had a, a vision of very niche market. For instance, um, they are involved in the motorcycle community and they wanted to produce 
products for the motorcycle community, and which is uh, have, they have a very high level of interest in that. But what they discovered is as they started doing merch for the motorcycle community, the people in the motorcycle community had kids that were in schools, teams, and sports. They owned businesses. And now, guess what? The minority of their business is selling merch into the motorcycle community. So the company vision isn't necessarily what you originally started your business as. It's where you're currently at or where you want to be headed. Company vision, where we want to be. To inform and inspire people using the messaging and medium of decorated apparel and personalized products, utilizing the power of personalization to create unique products that represent current trends and spread awareness within our community. Personalization. And so you'll notice in my company vision, the power of personalization, create unique products. That's about graphics. And I think that's the one part of your business that you have a lot of control over. In the marketplace, the company that has the better looking products is ultimately going to succeed in the marketplace. If you're selling product A and you know local competitors selling product A and your product looks better, has cooler graphics, is more connected to the community, you're more than likely going to do better. Now, bear in mind, you have to have a sales organization to back that up. So when I'm talking about that creative aspect of the business, that's really the foundation of my vision for a decorated apparel business is almost operating like a branding company or a marketing company where I'm really helping my clients establish products that are going to really benefit their business beyond just having cool stuff to wear. Um, help to promote their causes and promote their organization. Defining your target markets. So in the case of Craig's Creations, target markets, schools, teams, and sports, local small businesses, dance, cheer, and fitness, you know, the folks that you associate through your church, event marketing, and then also fundraising, which is something that's near and dear to my heart. So if I was going to retire and launch Craig's Creations as a real active business, this these would be the target markets that I would go after. And I would go after initially I, I would really go after the schools, teams, and sports because that's an area that I really know. And then I would also uh, certainly uh, focus on the low-hanging fruit. I'm not going to be interested in competing with bids, formal channels. What I'm interested in doing is creating merchandising programs for booster clubs and spirit wear and things of that nature. Our competitors' strength and weaknesses, small local decorating companies. I just created some um, fictitious companies there, but the small local decorating companies, which there are a plethora of those in my community, that's really going to be my competition. I think it's just human nature, just assume that you're going to do business on a local basis because you live in that community. But now with the internet, certainly you have the opportunity to be national and your business is a virtual business. So if you're focusing a good portion of your business off of the internet, chances are you can do business all over the country. And do you think the customer automatically looks at where that company is located before they make a decision as to whether they want to pursue buying from them? I don't think so. I think most companies have, unless their identity is right there on their website, I think most companies have a, you know, about us or a contact um, section on their website where if I want to dig a little bit, I could figure out where this company is located. No, I'm making my decision based on the visual presence of the website, what it looks like. Is it clear what they're doing? Am I seeing graphics and products that I can connect with that I'd like to be able to purchase? And wow, this company can do that for me. You don't have to be a local business, but you know, I'm also going to be competing with the large online resellers. And I said this in a past webcast, when a local school booster is buying from Custom Inc., they just thought it was easier and they saw a television commercial and they go to Custom Inc. and they place an order there's two things that are happening. Number one, they're paying an inflated retail price. So they're paying full boat retail. It actually inflated re retail. If you look at the pricing structure of Custom Inc., it's, it's very expensive. And number two is their organization is not getting a penny of that profit. So let's say that t-shirt's $30 is what I'm paying for it. We all know the cost of that t-shirt with the screen print quantity, 100 shirts, it's probably 4 to $5. So Custom Inc.'s making $25.00. I'm paying $30 a shirt and my school organization is getting nothing for that. Whereas, you know, if I go to a customer and say, hey, listen, we can set up a store for you and we'll set a retail price and I'm going to give you a percentage of profit. Not, not only are we, can we set it up so you get a better value for your people, well, maybe we price the t-shirts at $20, but for every shirt that's sold, you're going to get a, a revenue share of 25%. So you're going to make $5 out of that shirt. That's a much better way of organizing. So when you're competing with these large online resellers, 
Um, home-based businesses. There's just a ton of home-based businesses. Are they a threat to my business? Home-based, I'm not talking about somebody that's operating a cricket cutter and a you know $150 Amazon heat press. We're, we're talking about small one and two people operations, which can do a lot of volume. You know, as a small one or two person operation working out of your home, if you have your business structured right, you have a web presence and a footprint in social media. I always consider home-based businesses to be a legitimate competitor because there's an army of them. And if I look at the local market in the Phoenix area, we'll divide the market into four pots. Pot number one is the big companies that are maybe have a national presence that, you know, have impressive websites. They run full service art departments. They're they're in Phoenix. There's some pretty big companies that do that. Blue media is one of the companies that comes to mind. They really operate as a advertising company. So you've got that level and then you have print shops and print shops are going to be your three to 10 employee companies typically doing screen printing, probably transfers, have an embroidery capability. I'm very connected with some of the the print shops here in the Phoenix community. That's the meat and potatoes of the decorated apparel industry in any community. Big retailers, there's maybe 20 of those folks here in Phoenix. These smaller print shops, probably 100. But you get into the home-based businesses, 1,000, 500. The fourth pot, you get into the kind of the crafter semi-businesses and they're in the tens of thousands, right? So, you know, you do have to identify your true head-to-head competitors. And my head-to-head competitors would probably be the smaller shops and home-based businesses. I'm not worried about competing with the big giant companies with outsized sales forces and sophisticated websites and things. I can do some things on a micro level and compete very favorably with those folks using technology, like for instance, hosting stores. What are our competitive advantages? You always want to look at that. What are the things uh, that you're doing well that you maybe want to pat yourself on the back over? You know, sophisticated graphics capability for producing custom artwork. If you have graphics flow, you have an extremely sophisticated graphics capability because you're leading into a very talented art department that's producing content and you have the ability to produce very high level graphics without the traditional learning curve and production time that somebody that was using, maybe had a graphic designer on staff and was using Adobe Illustrator, CorelDRAW, or Photoshop to create graphics. You could do that on your phone. So you can get a very high level on-trend retail graphic in front of a customer. Every single person on this webinar that is a graphics full client can make the claim they have a sophisticated graphics capability because you do. Production equipment that facilitates small orders, personalization, and sampling. Listen, if I'm starting a business tomorrow, I'm not buying an embroidery machine. I'll have a vinyl cutter. I already own a vinyl cutter. I own a very nice heat press. I'm going to do the majority of my production is going to be around direct-to-film transfers or hybrid digital transfers. I'd be ordering my transfers through Supercolor because I love the company, I love the people, and I love the product, and they're just a great company to work with. I want to be able to facilitate small orders because I know I can get my foot in the door with a small order and it can grow into something. Am I going to be interested in doing one-offs? No. I would set up my minimum order quantities at a level where you have to order at least maybe 10 or 12 shirts. Now with the minimum order quantities on these direct film transfers being so low, uh, I can go on the Supercolor website right now. I can place an order for 10 units and I can have that order here in two business days. Do I need to have a direct-to-film printer on facility? No. Uh, What would I use my vinyl cutter for? I'd use my vinyl cutter for personalization, names and numbers, or if I want to name drop something. Have a big focus of what I'm going to do is going to be personalization because with a, a vinyl cutter specifically, my production costs are the same if I have the same graphic that has all the same logo versus 10 different graphics with a name drop. You know, it's same logo, then the only part of it that changes is the name drop. So I can do that with a vinyl cutter, which is awesome. And maybe if you have sublimation equipment or direct to film transfer equipment or DTG um, would be another good choice for personalization. I really want to be able to have the small production orders. And if I have a really big order, like for embroidery or screen printing, I'm going to outsource that. We're really fortunate here in the Phoenix area. We have some great printers here in the Phoenix area that are print to the trade, meaning they don't sell direct to customers. They just simply do contract printing. And the same can be said for uh, the embroidery contract embroiderers that are in a community, which is really handy. So I can still sell those products and collect the margin, but I don't have to have the production equipment myself. But for those of you that do have the production equipment, you know, you have a step up because you have 
the ability to respond very favorably and your costs are likely lower than mine if I'm doing contract work. Reliable supply chain that enables us to respond quickly to orders. Hey, I'm going to go to Sanmar. I'm going to go to Alpha. I'm going to go to SNS. I'm going to see who's going to give me the best deal. I'm going to leverage all three of those um, large distributor of um, blank wholesale products against each other. I'm going to have a real conversation with them and I'm going to see if, if I can leverage a deal. Now, I have to have a little bit of clout in order to do that. So I have to have an established business present and they're probably going to want some level of commitment from me. Hey, we can do this, but you know, we need you to hit these numbers, but I'm just not going to take face value uh, on what they're pricing. I'm going to try to leverage to get the best possible pricing plan and discounts that are available to me. And I can also do that by joining certain um, buying cooperatives as well as being a part of a, a trade group like ASI or PPAI or somebody of, of that nature. I want to be able to offer a wide variety of processes, both in-house and outsource. So we're talking about being able to outsource the screen printing and the embroidery, but in-house doing you know the heat pressing. And I, I always kind of share this with with clients and, and a lot of times with promotional products distributors is, listen, if if you want to get finished product made, so you go to a supplier and they will decorate it for you, they're going to keep the lion's share of the profit. So they're maybe going to charge you 12 to $15 for that shirt. And you're going to sell that shirt for maybe $20. Just throwing some round numbers out there. But if I get the heat transfer made, all I have to do is the pressing and I can buy that shirt for two to three dollars, maybe four at the outside, and I can buy that the transfer in for two bucks. So I got a cost between four and six dollars. And guess who gets to keep the profit? I do. And really the only extra level of work is pressing those shirts. And I can press when I'm in a groove, I can usually press about 30 shirts an hour. That's pretty good groove for me, depending on the transfer and if it needs a double hit. You know, you're getting to keep all that profit. And here's the other thing is you can hire part-time labor to do that. If you have family members that just need a little extra work, or you have friends that need a little extra work, or maybe you want to do something for the community and employ some folks within your community, give them an opportunity. You can always play in piecework as well. So I always want to have that control with the heat press. I'm not going to have somebody else do what we call print on demand. And it brings up another kind of mini topic here is there, there is something called passive selling. And I'm I am a fan of passive selling and what passive selling is, is you create a graphic, you load it up on Amazon merch, or you load it up onto Etsy and you connect that product that you're selling through those websites through a fulfillment house, somebody like Printful. And all you're doing is loading a graphic, configuring a product in a website and they're drop shipping it. They're doing everything for you. They're handling the whole process end to end, bagging it putting the shipping label, shipping it. And what what do you get to keep in the context of that kind of, of, of passive selling situation? They're going to set the retail price or give you some ranges of what the retail price is. But if they're selling the shirt for 25 bucks, you know, you're going to be fortunate if you make $3 on that. So people are always like, yeah, I mean, I do the passive selling, but you know, I, in order to make 300 bucks, you know, I got to sell a hundred shirts. That's a lot of shirts. But if you did it yourself, probably make 15 bucks a shirt, you'd have made $1,500 on the same deal. So can you have your cake and eat it too? Um, yeah, there's some middle ground. The middle ground would be, you know, drop shipping from say Sam R Alpha or SNS to a contract printer, them printing it. And you won't even see the product. I have a good customer of mine, Allison Merton, and she always jokes with me and she says, Hey, Craig, I don't even see the products ever. So the only way I'm going to ever see a product is if it's being worn by somebody out in the out in the wild, so to speak, because she is just running everything through contract printers and she runs all of her merch through her ink soft stores, sets up a store, runs it for two to three weeks, closes the store, collates the orders, sends the orders, the blank goods into her contract printer, printer prints, boxes, blind drop ships done. You know, that's different than this concept of passive selling. Passive selling is literally you're doing nothing. You have no connectivity to the the end user, the person that's purchasing the product. And typically in those kind of scenarios, it's pre-printed product. So competitive pricing that meets the marketing conditions in our community. I want to be competitive, but I can tell you, I'm not going to be the low price leader at all, nowhere near it because my time is too valuable. And the way I always explain it to customers, and this is just good advice is if you're 
dealing, you know, face to face or on a phone with the client and they're asking for a better deal because people are going to ask these days. Some individuals are just, you know, kind of shameless about that. They're just going to try to negotiate with you. And you can tell them, you know, I, I learned this from Allison Merton as well. And she said, you know, I'll tell the customer, it's like, part of what you're paying for is me. So you're paying for my graphics, my creativity. You know, you can get somebody on the phone if there's a problem and a kid forgets his shirt on the bus and you need an, another shirt, I can make that happen. Are you able to get that same service? The person on the other end has already convinced themselves that this lower price that they're paying is going to be comparable to what the product and service level that they're currently getting. Even though we probably know that's not going to be the truth, um, they've convinced them, themselves. So sometimes you're just going to lose customers when there's a buyer changeover and they already have other vendors that they've worked with. And that's, I think, one of the reasons that it's critically important to always be acquiring new clients. That's why new client acquisition is so important because there's always going to be some level of, of attrition. So I'm not going to build my business around pricing, but I'll, I'll certainly be competitive. I'm going to charge extra for services. If you want it bagged and tagged, you're going to pay extra for that. I'm not going to give free shipping. Shipping's a hard cost to me. You know, I can tell the customer and say, hey, listen, if you want free shipping, I'll just inflate the price a little bit and we'll build it in if that works a little better for you. And I'm going to stand behind the quality of my products. I'm going to make sure if there's a misshipped order and there's an unhappy customer, even though that little bit of fear kind of pops into your head, we're like, oh man, I'm going to have to eat these shirts. I'm going to still stand behind that order because I believe in the long run that balances out. And when we had our decorated apparel business, Desert Sportswear, that just was a cost of doing business and we'd recoup our costs via sample sell or selling closeouts. So that was always an option. I want to be embedded in our local community and I want to, I want to build my business off my reputation because that's free advertising that you get. When somebody's had a positive experience and they pass that positive experience on to another customer, and that results in a referral, you know, it didn't cost you anything. You're being rewarded for the good work that you've done. And Mark Heiss, that's been a regular uh, participant in this education series and has a shop in Yellow Springs, Ohio, Lineshare, his business has been built off of Facebook groups. With that being said, marketing goals, social media, email, and e-commerce, I think it's critically important to have a plan. Plan for social media should not be, hey, whenever I feel like it, I'm going to post on Instagram. That's, that's not a plan. That's just a response. Having a plan, setting up a, a schedule for your posting, posting things that are visual. I think one of the best things you can do is post examples of your work. And, and what you're doing is you're creating your virtual showroom. They can go to your Instagram account. They can see your work. They see the quality of what you're doing, inspires them to purchase, and it really puts the best foot forward. I'm signing up for Inksaw. That's the first pennies I'm going to make. I'm not saying that because I'm part of the Inktabo family, which owns Inksop. I'm saying that because I know in the modern business environment that A, Inksop is the best platform in our industry, but that I'm going to leverage an online shopping experience and I'm going to control my clients through stores. I'm going to produce a store for that customer before I've even sold them. I'm going to go into my graphics account. I'm going to name drop some graphics. I'm going to populate them into a store. I'm going to send a link to the store to the potential client. And I'm going to tell them, hey, this is kind of how we operate. This is what we can do. I've put some products into this store right now, but we can certainly develop some additional customized graphics around this and we'll work together to develop the product line. But I just wanted to, you to see how it works. How many people do that in the marketplace? How many people are actually doing that? Very, very, very few. If there's one sales technique that I, I can't emphasize enough, it's creating these pitch stores in advance of a sale to really add that level of credibility. And one of the things that I do, and I do this with, with typically with partners or folks that, you know, I just can't get a hold of them. They're ghosting me. I'll record a little loom video with just, Hey, you know, I know it's busy time, but just recorded this little video for you. And I just want to kind of bring you up to speed on what we're doing. And you're going to see a link in the email. I put together a little store, just an introduction. I'm just going to record it in loom, take that link and pop that into either a text message, which is really effective or pop that into a, a quickie little email because do people pick up the phone these days? No, they don't. I am going to create stores for all my primary clients, even if they are not purchasing via an online interface. Even if it's just somebody that's regularly reordering, I'm going to still create a store for them because I can create a customer portal in my Inksoft and they can log into their portal. They can see all their past orders. They can see all their artwork. They can initiate a reorder. If they want to upload some artwork and get a quote using the designer, they can do that. So I'm going to make it really convenient for my customers to purchase from me. And I had an interview with a client not so long ago, and he shared with me that 
his strategy has become customer retention and just taking all the opportunities within his existing customer base and maxing them out. Keeping customers, selling more products to his existing customers, making sure that they think of him for all of their needs. Because he said to me, which was resonated, was it's a lot easier for me to keep customers and sell more to existing customers than to acquire new ones. I think no truer statement has ever been said. I'm going to get an email marketing software. I'm probably going to utilize MailChimp or Constant Contact or Benchmark, one of those. I'm a big MailChimp fan. I think it's pretty easy. It integrates with QuickBooks. It integrates with a lot of um, platforms. It integrates with Inksoft. I don't know if you guys knew that. I'm going to use email marketing and I'm going to become an expert in email I'm already pretty knowledgeable about email marketing, but I'm really going to become an expert in email marketing using AI to test subject lines. If you're not using chat GPT to test subject lines and create email copy, it's an, an amazing set of tools and resources for doing that. It's, it's absolutely remarkable. I'm going to target local groups and businesses with sampling. So I'll put together some samples and then just drop those on people. I will go in and do some door knocking and say, hey, my name is Greg Mertens. I'm part of the community. I've got a, a local business that I do. We're full service creative. I put together just kind of a fun little community baseball cap or community t-shirt. I'd like you to have one of these kind of a sample of our work. Hey, I'm going to send you a little email and in that email, I'm going to have a link to a store. I just put together a little sample store for you to kind of demonstrate what our capabilities are. You know, these are the kind of things that I'm going to do. And I know it's a little scary, you know, going in and banging doors and talking to people face to face. It's a little scary, but I got to tell you, it's still one of the most effective campaigns. And you've heard me talk about, you know, having a balanced offense. Your ground game is your handshaking, your phone calls, your human presence, maybe your brick and mortar if you have that. And then your passing game is all what you're using technology for, um, e-commerce stores, and your social media presence, your emailing. I think if you combine all of those things together, both the ground game and the passing game, you have what's called a balanced offense. And I don't know, it just seems like every time a team wins the Super Bowl or a national championship in football, they have a balanced offense. And one of the other things I would certainly do is integrate the graphics flow art portal into my social media, as well as my email campaigns and my website. That is the, the business plan for Craig's Creations. Digging a little deeper, once I've gotten past my one page business plan, it actually becomes important, I believe, to dig a little bit deep, deeper and delve into strategy a little bit. And so one of the things that I've put together for you guys, the plan, digging a little bit deeper into the plan. I put together a sample who we're all about. Our decorated apparel business will offer high quality custom t-shirts, hoodies, and other clothing items to customers looking for unique personalized garments who have focused on providing excellent customer service. Quick turnaround times to ensure that our clients are completely satisfied with their orders. And then here, here's what we're going to specialize in. Personalized garments like t-shirts, sweatshirts, headwear, emphasis on customer service or client satisfaction, quick turnaround time to meet our customers' expectations. So taking a, you know, a little bit deeper dive into strategy, a, a little bit of market analysis, you know, we're in a, we're in a good market. You know, my dad used to always say the t-shirt market, so to speak, or the t-shirt business, t-biz, is generally insulated from economic turmoil. You know, people are always going to be wearing shirts. Kids are always going to be competing with sports. Little girls and little boys are going to be involved in dance competitions. Competitions present, but differentiation through customer service and a variety of customizable options. It really comes down to customization. You being able to match up products that connect with people and connect with people on an emotional level, meaning a really cool graphic, that creates a memory for that event or promotion or for that team is going to do better in the marketplace. And I think one of the things that you can do, what I call out graphic people, products and services. So finding that out. So basically what I've done is kind of put together a slideshow that kind of compelling arguments for why I'm doing these things, but also I'll put some visuals in here. Products include t-shirts, hoodies, hats, and more. I'm going to utilize screen printing, DTF, and embroidery. Um, I'm definitely going to have design services for creating personalized products marketing and sales, social media, local advertising. I'm going to definitely leverage partnerships, get involved in the community chamber of commerce, and I'm going to use online sales a lot for my marketing. And I'm going to have an active presence in Facebook, Instagram, probably not Twitter or now known as X. You can scratch that out and put TikTok in there. And nobody ever wants to talk about financial projections, but you, you need to do that. You need to set a budget. You need to go through that process, set some financial goals, focus on the high margin parts of your business. Where are your startup costs coming? Are you going to a small business loan or are you going to self-fund? 
do personal investment, you got to bring a partner in. Revenue generation is going to come from decorated apparels and design services. So yes, I am going to charge for artwork. Nobody is going to get my valuable time and years of experience doing graphic design for free. And so I'm going to create some clear boundaries for my customers. And that's also going to create an expectation of repeat business and customer loyalty. If I do well by a client, they're certainly going to continue to buy from me. And I put together some just very more specific things on social media, you know, identifying target markets, demographics, interests, and needs. If you're going to do Facebook advertising, there's some great analytical tools that allow you to do that. Um, picking my platforms and goes, I put TikTok in there, uh, developing a content calendar for consistent engaging posts. So I actually would put that on a calendar. I'd set up my Google calendar and set up a content calendar of exactly what I'm going to post. I do that a month in advance, um, including topics. Um, so I have a little bit of prep time. And one of the, I think, more spontaneous things that you can do is as you're pulling shirts off the heat transfer press or the end of the dryer or taking them out of the hoop, of the embroidery machine, taking a live video of that process and holding up that merch. That's one of the smartest ways to promote your business. It's interactive. It's personal. You're getting to show off your work. There's a smile, a video delivering product to somebody. Hey, it's like an unboxing. Hey, have you seen your new shirts here? Let me pull them out of the box and show them to you. You got all those smiles on the face. So taking advantage of some of those milestone moments to not only create a memory, but to capture that memory and post it in social media, I think is is very, very smart. Create visually appealing content with high quality photos and graphics, and that's what I was talking about there. Encourage audience engagements to responses, polls, and interactive features. Using hashtags and tagging for increased visibility. You have to learn tagging. Tagging is not hard, but you have to learn tagging. And if you're not using hashtags or tagging in your social media posts, then you're really missing a lot of reach. And so tagging is when you're posting on Instagram and you did some merch for a group, you at them, put at whatever the name of their group is, their account, and they're automatically copied in on that. And that amplifies the the reach of that post. And then the other, and anybody that's following that account will be able to, to participate in comments and things of that nature for that particular post. And then hashtags are what people are looking for and how posts are grouped together in social media. So the easiest way to do hashtags is look at the successful companies in our industry and just copy their hashtags. We have a whole list, like in our marketing department, we have a whole list of hashtags that we use. It's very thought out for SEO. Analyze and adjust strategy based on social media analytics. So, you know, if you're posting on social media, I can go on YouTube right now and I can see my videos. A conclusion, with a strong focus on customer satisfaction and high quality products, believe that our decorated apparel business will be a success. We are confident that our marketing efforts and excellent products and services will help us to quickly establish a strong customer base and generate significant revenue. So key point, strong belief in marketing efforts and excellent products and service. You know, marketing is sales, right? And that's what drives your sales engine. So you can have the greatest products and services on the planet, but if you don't have a sales engine and marketing, there's obviously human capital invest, invested in that. You know, that's your phone calls and your emails and talking to people. But there's a lot of technology currently using AI to write provocative and compelling email copy with good, strong subject lines. Um, you know, there's so much great um, content available through AI. And anticipation of rapid establishment of strong customer base and significant revenue generation. So how do I know that AI is a powerful tool for copywriting and editing? Because this presentation that you just watched, this is what it was. Let me show you what it was. It was this big, long presentation, and I had to turn it into a slide deck. So what I did is I used ChatGPT, and I went to my ChatGPT free account, and I said to ChatGPT, I said, summarize each section into a one-sentence description, title, and bullet points, and then I copy and pasted the executive summary from the four-page document in there, and look what it spit out. And I had to do very little editing on that. So it took that very complex, long document and summarized it for me. The other magical AI thing that I use is I use the the tool that's built into Microsoft Edge and Windows, which is called Copilot. And so if you open up your Bing browser, you have a little icon here that says Copilot. This is all AI generated. This is Microsoft's AI. And here, let's type something in here that's kind of fun. What equipment do I need 
to get started in screen printing. Microsoft AI bot, it's really sophisticated, but it's also leveraging chat GPT. It's telling me everything I need. I need a press. I need, probably going to tell me an ex, you need screens. Probably going to tell me I need an exposure unit. It's even giving me pricing on whether I could buy and some resources for where I can buy it. Emulsion, ink, a squeegee. It's just absolutely, it's writing this. It's, it's taking a data set that's been loaded into its, you know, AI and it's writing this all out. I'm certainly going to encourage all of you to put together a brief one page business plan. I think the, the three big pieces of advice that I would give you is don't wait, do it now. Strike while the iron's hot. You've got a little bit of time on your hands to do it. Set some very specific goals and objectives, some benchmarks that you'd like to hit. For instance, I am going to commit for 2024 to post to Instagram three times a week, things of that nature. And then monitor the effectiveness, find the things that work, make sure you do more of them, find the things that don't work, make sure you eliminate them or do less of them. So I think one of the things that happens is we're not always the best judges of ourselves, bringing in some outside people, you know, your friends, your trusted friends somebody that is successful in business you know i've i've been the i've had the true blessing of being able to have wonderful mentors in my in my business life and in my personal life as well but running ideas past people you know if you have somebody that's in your community maybe somebody you go to church with or a family friend and they're a successful business person you know running your business plan past them um seeking advice joining you know mastermind groups or other small business groups getting involved in the chamber of commerce you don't have to do these things on an island and you know the, the collective intelligence of our community is there to lift us all up right so if we can plug into a network of people that have been there or experienced that can share their experience with you if i don't see you before the new year's have an excellent holiday season and see you in 2024 with your brand new one-page business plan thank you